Okay, we're back for the final segment of automatic input devices. We're going to be talking about sensors. Okay, now sensors are a lot different than uh, your automatic, your mechanical automatic input devices. Okay, um, they can, they will also do the switching in a control relay, in a uh, relay logic circuit. Uh, it'll switch on and off some contacts. Um, they're not the same type of hard contacts that you're used to seeing with the uh, that we talked about with the limit switches and the pressure switches in your um, in your push buttons and things like that. These are done electronically. We're going to get into that. But um, sensors can also uh, give us readings of variable uh, pressures or variable liquids or uh, things like that. They can give us variations in their signals. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's an analog signal that could be not necessarily on and off, but some variation of the, uh, the magnitude at which uh, whatever it is that they're measuring, okay? We're not going to get into the analog signals because we don't use those in relay logic, okay? Relay logic has no place for a varying voltage. We either have it on or off in relay logic. Now, when you get into PLCs, yes, you do have analog signals that you will want to measure. But for relay logic, analog doesn't have a place because, again, our devices turn either on or they turn off. So we can't have that varied voltage. So we're going to move along here with our sensors. Okay, we've got about uh, three different kinds. Okay, like I said, uh, like in the mechanical input devices, they do uh, detect when something is present and they'll change the signal. Okay, a lot of times, uh, most times, they're used to either detect the presence of something that's very, very close to them or if something's obstructing them. Okay, we'll, you'll see what I'm talking about as we move through the different sensors. Okay. Uh, and again, they some of them uh, some of them will provide measurement data again, such as weight as a load cell as a sensor, um, the levels, uh, ultrasonic levels um, sensors can detect uh, with sound waves the depth of, for example, I've used in sumps before uh, large large pits with sumps, and and they can, we use um, ultrasonic waves to detect the level of the water. And it's a continuous signal, okay, and also speed uh, that can be used as well. But again, we're going to stick with more of the on-off uh, digital signals from these devices. Okay, the three most common types, and the three that you're going to work with in the lab, are going to be the inductive proximity switch, the capacitive proximity switch, and also the photo eye. This one might be called a photoelectric sensor. Okay, but we refer to them as photo eyes for the most part. Okay, there are, like I said, there are a ton more. There's the ultrasonic, the radar is used load cells, thermocouples, okay, uh, flow meters and things like that. They have, we've got a lot of different types of uh, sensors, but we're just going to focus on the three most commonly used right now, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is the inductive proximity switch, okay? Um, it's barrel shaped and sometimes, and sometimes it's square. It looks a lot like a limit switch, okay? Um, but uh, the, it gets its name because um, we measure something in very close proximity to the switch itself, okay? Remember with the limit switch, we, uh, we had about that far from the actual switch head itself and, and we actually put the cat whisker out there, that long arm out there to reach out and measure something for, you know, 12, 14 inches away from the actual switch. Well, in the, induct, the proximity switch uh, measures things much, much closer, okay? But you do have a couple of different types uh, and a couple of different styles, okay? Right, and again, as we always talk about, this is the symbol, okay? And they have the normally open and normally closed uh, contact configuration. Again, now, now, with sensors, we're using electronics. We're not using the hard contacts that we've talked about before. We're going to use electronic circuitry. But these are the, uh, sim the symbols that you will see in your uh, relay logic, okay? So, again, proximity switches. Uh, the inductive ones in particular, we're talking about inductive proximity switches, okay? These detect uh, targets at very close proximity, okay? Uh, and I've seen these used in a lot of different applications. Um, when, a, when, a, when a component or a, a part of a machine will come very close, uh, it will come into place, uh, it makes no contact like it does with a limit switch, okay? There's no contact required uh, for it to, to sense it or to pick up that the part is present or the uh, cylinder is retracted, or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I've got an example here, a rather heavy one. Okay. This is a cylinder. Okay. And inside it, and, and I was, you'll you'll notice that. Remember, I told you that you had um, a lot of different styles of proximity switches. If I can get the screws out of this one, 
Okay, this is proximity switch mounted into this cylinder. Okay, and what it does is it goes down there and it detects when the um, it detects when the cylinder has been retracted. The piston uh, face of it will come in close proximity to that switch, and when it does, that switch will activate. It will turn on and it will give us a signal that says, hey, it's fully retracted. There's also one on the opposite side that says that it's fully extended. And these, these, what these do is they sense the uh, piston, okay, like this is the extend proximity switch down in the piston in the cylinder. It will go there and when it senses that piston, it's very close proximity switch. You could not do that with a limit switch. So we're using this electronic sensor and it will come in uh, very close proximity and it will say, okay, the piston's all the way out, so it's fully extended. You got, likewise, you've got another one back here, and it comes in close proximity, and, but never makes contact, and it says, okay, it's, uh, the uh, cylinder has retracted because the piston has retracted, okay? So we're, we're gonna keep working through this as we go along, but it detects both ferrous metal, this is the, pro the inductive proximity switch we're talking about. It detects both ferrous and non-ferrous metals, okay? And you can, you can tell, like aluminum, copper, uh, steel, you know, this, these are ferrous and non-ferrous metals. You can always tell a ferrous metal by if you uh, take it up to a grinder and it sparks, that's a ferrous metal, okay? If it doesn't, then it's non-ferrous, but they're still uh, metal regardless of in this, in the proximity switch can pick them up, okay? Uh, they are, these are rather rugged. Um, I've seen a lot of them take some, a lot of abuse. They look kind of small, um, and you'll see them in the lab. You've got, we've got them in the lab. But uh, they're going to detect metal, metal objects, and I've seen them, like I said, uh, take some pretty good abuse, and they still work. They have to be broken pretty good, uh, busted up pretty good, and not, uh, not to work. But uh, just a quick way, uh, a quick thing of uh, you know, how it works. I don't want to get real deep into this, okay, the science behind it or anything like that. But what the inductive proximity switch does is it sends out an electromagnetic field, okay? And that magnetic field, um, it hits that metal, remember this is inductive proximity switch, it hits the metal and it creates these eddy currents in, in, the, in the actual material that it's detecting. So if I've got a piece of steel passing in front of my proximity switch, my proximity switch is sending out an electromagnetic field, okay, as it passes through, passes by the piece of metal uh, there, there's, that's in front of the sensor, the sensor uh, sending out that magnetic field creates the eddy currents inside the target itself, the, the, the material that's passing in front of the sensor. And these, uh, these eddy currents will reduce the strength of the signal. And the oscillator inside here, again, this is electronics, we're not, not really worried about it, but the oscillator detects uh, a change in the strength of, of the signal, okay, as, as it's coming back in. All right, so um, that's how it kind of works. And once it senses, uh, once it detects a, a change, it, that detects a, a change, uh, senses a change, and it sends us an output signal. That output signal is basically the contact closure. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is we're passing something in front of the magnetic field. It senses that it's there and it sends us an output signal. Now, um, that output signal, like I said, is in our uh, control circuitry, okay? So this is the symbol for the proximity switch. Uh, we, pass, um, we pass something in close proximity to the switch and this set of contacts will close. Now, again, these are not the hard contacts we're used to seeing in the limit switches. These are electronic, these are, as you saw uh, back here, there are no contacts, so to speak, that close. Uh, this is all through uh, uh, microcircuitry, and it just triggers an output uh, once it senses it. And once, this, once the target goes away, the, the uh, strength of, of the uh, field is, is in the oscillator is detected, and it goes back up, and the threshold is broken, and then it takes the output signal away, and we then open the contacts back up, okay? Now, again, uh, it could, but, uh, when it senses a, tar a target, when, it's, uh, when it senses a metal object, it could open the contacts. It could be normally closed, and they open the contacts, so it could go either way, okay? But this is the symbol for the proximity switch. It's, that's generally how it works, okay? The other type of, of uh, proximity switch is the capacitive, okay? Uh, capacitive will measure, um, it will measure uh, anything, just about anything, okay? Uh, even skin, uh, it will measure paper, cardboard, whatever. It will also measure me uh, metal as well, okay? And there are places where uh, you want to differentiate to use both kinds, okay? But again, it detects a target in close proximity. 
Um, and, and it could be non-metallic, it, it could be uh, glass as well. Uh, they're just as rugged as the, as the inductive proximity. Okay, and in this case, it's very, very similar, except for instead of an electromagnetic field, I'm using the same drawing. This is not electromagnetic field. Instead, we're using an electrostatic field, okay? And so when the target enters the, the electrostatic field, it changes the capacitance in the oscillator, whereas we change the strength of the, uh, with the eddy currents in the inductive wind, we are changing the strength with the, uh, in, in the, uh, changing the capacitance, excuse me, in the oscillator. And then once it senses uh, a certain amount of change when it crosses that threshold, it will then fire the output signal and it will look just like this, okay? No difference between it. It will be normally, it will say uh, inductive proximity or capacitive if they're using two of them in the same system. But uh, again, the symbol is the same for inductive or capacitive, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's how, how that's how those work. And again, using my cylinder that I held up for you, um, that 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 uh, that um, cylinder piston comes very very close. Okay, so that it, that one is a um, is an inductive uh, excuse me, inductive proximity switch. We, pro we provide a voltage to it. Okay, uh, so because it's got to have a voltage in order to operate. All right. So we provide a voltage to it, and then the voltage also passes through the contacts, the, electro the electronic circuitry, and it'll pass the signal through once it sees that piston uh, right up there against that close, that, that close. Like I said, you can never do that with a limit switch. So that's your uh, capacitive and your inductive proximity switches. You're gonna work with both of those. Uh, you're gonna put different targets in front of them in the lab, okay? But the other thing I want to talk about too, the last sensor that we're going to talk about is the photo eye. A lot of these used. Uh, for, I used a, a uh, garage door reference earlier, okay? You have photo eyes that shoot across the garage door. It's actually a, by law now, um, so that if uh, something breaks that photo eye beam, okay, uh, then the door automatically retracts, okay? Um, that's actually federal law now. But uh, the, uh, just like all the other sensors and the input devices, just ton of different manufacturers, a lot of shapes, uh, you know, applications, uh, everything. It's just, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, Banner makes them, again, Square D makes them, Alan Bradley makes them, there are just a ton of them out there. But they all work basically the same way. There are, um, basically what happens is uh, you have, a, um, uh, you have a, a controlled light signal being sent out from a transmitter and a receiver that sees this, okay? Uh, and this, the two components that are needed are the transmitter and the receiver, okay? All right, so this is how, this is basically how it works. We've got the um, transmitter or emitter, it's sometimes called, okay? And it is sending out a high frequency LED light, okay? Very rapidly uh, turning on and off uh, of, a, of an LED light, okay? And you have a receiver over here, okay? And it picks up that signal, okay? And it gives us an output, okay? And let's see. Okay, I got our I got our uh, schematic a little bit later on. Okay, generally this is the type that works in your garage for your photo op. Okay, but in industry we have several different types. Okay, we're gonna break them out. Um, we're gonna break them out here. <clears throat> and we got the three types of photo eyes: are the through beam, we have the retro reflective uh, scanning type. And we have the diffused scanning type. We're going to break them down. It's important that you do understand the differences between these because you'll have all three of these out in industry and they're used in three different applications and sometimes one will not work like the other one will, okay? So let's break it down just a little bit. Okay, the transmitter uh, for on the, on the through beam, this is the through beam style, okay? The transmitter is physically aligned with the receiver like we saw right here. It's physically in alignment with its receiver. Okay, and it's sending out that, uh, that LED light at a uh, controlled frequency, okay? And the receiver is tuned or dialed in to receive that frequency of light, okay? So um, we've got the emitter and it's passing through here to the receiver, okay? If anything, for example, this, this arrow right here, uh, if, whenever it sees the signal, we've got an output turned on, okay? But if we break that beam, okay, it will turn that signal off. We'll lose our, our signal coming out, all right? So we have the emitter. As long as our receiver is seeing it, no problem. Our system's going to run. A lot of these are used in safety uh, devices, for safety devices, and they're also for part presence as well. So if, if you've got, uh, you know, 
uh, part of your machine that ro runs back and forth up a, up a track or something like that in a rail um, or, some, or wh whatever the case may be, you can use photo eyes and if it breaks the photo eye, you can, it, it can be part of your system's control. So, but in this case, we got, a, we got an emitter sending a signal to the, to the uh, receiver and it's going to be, everything's going to be fine until we break that beam and the receiver no longer sees it and that's when it changes the state of our control relay logic uh, contacts, okay? And again, these are not the uh, hard contacts we're used to, it's the circuitry, but we, we use that you know, per permissibility or permissiveness to go through the, uh, con for the uh, uh, sensor, okay? Now, uh, this is the symbol for a photo eye, okay? So again, uh, as long as we're not, as long as the emitter is sending a signal and the receiver see, is seeing it, we're going to turn our motor on. The minute we block it, this opens up and our motor's not going to run. I keep using this uh, schematic just because it's familiar to, with us, okay? All right. Um, and this, of course, is the same, same uh, schematic, okay? Um, when the receiver is no longer getting a signal, the output is turned off, like I said earlier, and our uh, output device is de-energized, okay? But that is, uh, that is wired into our control circuit, okay? Now, the other one that we're going to talk about is the retroreflective sensor, all right? This one, uh, <clears throat> the transmitter and the receiver are housed in one unit. You kind of can tell this top side is going to be your transmitter and the bottom side is going to be your receiver. So what happens with these, uh, the transmitter, uh, half of it, sends out the light signal just like we talked about earlier, okay? And there is a reflector re required to bounce that light back to the receiver part. Now, these get a little tricky because you, you have to adjust that uh, reflector just so. And they have to be very solid, very stable, uh, and they are susceptible to vibration. So if they start vibrating, it's going to make that beam kind of shoot all over the place and not come back to the receiver. And it's going to think I've got some type of obstruction when there really isn't. So um, I've seen some of these mounted on some flimsy posts, some flimsy pieces of Unistrut, um, and they just kind of go all over the place, particularly when a fork truck or heavy piece of equipment comes by, it shakes it, and next thing you know, you've got a broken photo eye beam and thinks it's got something obstructing it. So you know, the ref my point is that the reflector has to be large enough and it has to be mounted on something very firm and, and concrete so that it doesn't move the beam around other than trying to shoot it back to the receiver part of that. Uh, unit. Okay, so um, again, same type thing, uh, except for instead of a uh, receiver on stuck out here, we've got a, re a reflector, and it's shooting the uh, light back to the receiver portion of the unit here. Okay, same symbol, same function. Okay, and if we break it, and the reflector cannot send a beam back because we it's not even receiving it. Okay, then it's going to change the state of our contacts in the uh, control circuit, okay? So that is the ref re retro reflective, all right? And the last type we're gonna talk about is the diffuse scanning. Now, this is a little different. Uh, it, it also uh, has the transmitter and the receiver mounted in the same unit, okay? Like this one, okay? Uh, the transmitter half, uh, uh, obviously, is gonna send out a signal, but there is no reflector or no receiver required for this one. What this one does, it takes an object that it's like uh, it's just shooting the light out, and it re and it's um, counting on the uh, object uh, reflecting the light back toward the uh, receiver part of it. Okay, the light sort of diffuses off of the object. Okay, and a certain uh, percentage of that light needs to come back and go to the re to the uh, receiver so that it can. Uh, uh, actuate, you know, and, and give us an output signal and change it in our control logic or our relay logic, excuse me. Uh, so um, those are really good because, like I said, you don't have to have a receiver that's properly mounted and, and perfectly aligned. You don't have to have the reflector that can, you know, kind of send our signal off in different directions if it gets bumped or something like that. Um, these are great for, for just detecting the object as it is and sending that light back. Okay, but there's always drawbacks too. Um, you have to be careful. One of the places that I saw these uh, really mess up our process was um, they changed the overhead light to these uh, to these uh, higher efficiency lights, 
and the lights were uh, going into the receiver it was because it was a lot brighter and, sh and uh, get, the light glare went into the receiver and it made the sensor think that it detected a part when there really wasn't anything. It was the light itself, okay, going back into that. I've seen that happen. So they had to put little hoods over the top of them to keep the, the overhead light from shining down on them and interfering with the diffused light trying to come back, okay? That's what, that's what the biggest problem was. It was uh, the, the overhead light was uh, interfering with the, light, the diffused light trying to go back uh, to the um, receiver off of the object that it was uh, detecting. Uh, this is the kind we've got in the lab. We don't require a reflector. We don't require uh, a, a, a receiver. Our the one in the lab is going to be a diffuse type, so you can stick your hand in front of it, and the light will, will bounce back off of your hand, and it will uh, make it break the photo out. Okay. Uh, again, the same thing. Uh, we have no target out here. No, no uh, receiver. No reflector. It's just requiring. The, um, the diffused light bouncing back off of the object and enough of it getting back to the, uh, to the uh, receiver part of that unit. Now these are adjustable to where you can change the threshold as, about, as to how much light uh, you want it to see or how much light is uh, required to bounce back in order for it to actuate. So you, some of these have some adjustments on them too, okay? But um, again, photo eye uh, symbol. Uh, no reflector on the diffuser type, no receiver on the diffuser type. It's requiring the light to come back, bounce off of the object. Those are a lot close, those have to be a lot closer in proximity, not nearly like the proximity switch, but you know, they just don't have that range. Uh, some, some photo eyes can go up to about 300 feet. Uh, not the diffuser, because it's going to be really hard for that signal to come back and scatter, that scattered signal coming back enough to where it can uh, detect it. But that's the diffuser type. Those are the three types of photo eyes uh, that I wanted to talk to you about, and also our, our proximity switches as well. You'll work with the proximity switch, both capacitive and uh, inductive, in the lab, as well as the photo eye. So you're going to get some, a chance to play with those. Uh, you'll work with the pressure switches and limit switches as well. Uh, you'll have those on the panels too. But anyway, that concludes automatic input devices. This is the third of three parts. So I uh, hope you've been able to watch the other two. I um, hope you've been taking some notes uh, and come into the lab and get ready to go to work. And uh, other than that, uh, we will see you in the lab and appreciate you watching. Thank you.